In this video, we're going to do a revision for the end of course practical exam. Now, the end of course practical exam has a duration of 1 hour 15 minutes. There are 40 marks in total and which carries a weightage of 20%. Now, um, in this 1 hour 15 minutes, usually the paper consists of 2 to 3 experiments uh, followed by a planning question. In preparation for the practical exam, it will be important for you to revise a few of the theory chapters as well because uh, in these chapters, the concepts are frequently being tested in some of the experiments as well. So for example, if you were to do a titration, you will definitely involve chemical calculations in the uh, discussion portion and uh, very likely it will involve knowledge on acids and bases as well. And then for planning question, um, usually it will touch on a few of uh, these chapters as well, like um, speed of reaction, energy changes, or even methods of separation. Now as mentioned, the practical exam consists of two to three experiments, and the experiments that can be tested within the O-level syllabus are listed in this slide. So the exam is likely to be a combination of two experiments, two to three experiments that are shown here. For example, it can be made up of a titration combined with a qualitative analysis um, experiment, or it can be a thermometric titration combined with a qualitative analysis experiment. Now in the next part of the video, we're going to look at each type of experiment um, as to how to conduct, what are the things to look out for when you're conducting such experiments, how to record the data, the things to look out for when you're recording the data, as well as uh, a bit on how to process the data in order to get any useful information from it. Before we look at the experiments, I think it's very useful that when you are doing two or more experiments to manage your workspace such that it doesn't obstruct the conduct of any experiment. For example, if you are, if the practical exam is made up of a titration and a qualitative analysis uh, question experiment, then at the very start, you are advised to pull the retort stand and the chemicals that are required for your titration towards yourself, all right, and to put the qualitative analysis reagents to one side neatly so that it doesn't obstruct the um, obstruct you when you are performing your titration experiment All right. once you're done with the titration push the retort stand and your burette uh, all the way in and bring the qualitative analysis um, reagents and apparatus towards yourself okay when you have a uh, proper working space, it will help you save a lot of time. Uh, it will um, minimize the accidents that can happen in the lab as well. Now as mentioned, one type of uh, experiment that you can get is an acid-based titration. This is the very, uh, this is the most common uh, type of titration that you can get. In an acid-based titration, um, you should have done this quite a few times. Uh, it requires the use of an indicator and the most common indicator that we uh, use in the lab is methyl orange. All right. So methyl orange is yellow when alkaline, so pH more than 7. It is acidic. Uh, sorry, it's a red when acidic. So uh, at the end point, we should see uh, one drop of the solution or one drop of the acid or alkali that turns the solution orange right so depending on what you have the what you have in the conical flask if it's an acid it will turn from red to orange if it's um al alkali in the conical flask it will turn from yellow to orange in the conduct of a titration um, there are few things to take note number one when you are filling up the burette, always check for air 
bubbles all right because this air bubble is going to cause uh, inaccuracies in your um, title value so if there is an air bubble in your burette how do you remove it again is to turn is to open the tap fully all right when you open the tap fully the solution will flush the bubble out in a very extreme case where the bubble refuses to lodge you have to bring it to the sink and give it a gentle shake so that the bubble dislodges uh, near the tap when you are filling up the burette uh, especially if you are using a funnel remember to remove the funnel after filling up the burette otherwise the solution will continue to trickle into your burette which will affect your burette reading okay the last thing is when students are doing titration um, especially if you are not careful when you are swallowing you will end up having some of the titrant by the sides of your conical flask and this will add to your tighter value but if they do not enter the solution they do not react uh, they do not undergo reaction so it's very important if you see a lot of splash at the sides of your conical flask to give it a rinse with deionized water so you rinse the sides with deionized water especially when you're reaching the end point now in doing a titration usually um, there are three distinct stages in the first stage you can just open the tap fully all right, and let the titran enter the solution in the conical flask uh, and at the start you should see that the, the um, there is no change to the color of the solution in the conical flask but after some time you will start to see um, the middle of the solution becoming changing to a different color okay for example if i have an alkaline solution with metal orange indicator okay. alkaline solution with metal orange indicator it will be yellow um, to start with it will be yellow All right. at some point in time you will start to see the middle portion having a hint of red All right. so at this point you cannot leave the tap fully open anymore but you need to add in squirts what do i mean by squirts means you open the tap for a few seconds and then you close it and then you shake all right when you shake the red color in the middle should disappear so you open the tap to add another squirt and then you shake the conical flask for and observe that the color disappears now over time you will notice that the the color seems to persist the red color seems to persist for a longer and longer time all right that means that you are approaching the end point that means that you can no longer add in squirts but you have to add drop white all right so you open the tap very very carefully to add one drop so the color should disappear again the red color will disappear add another drop shake so the conical flask the color should disappear and you continue doing so until that one drop of acid um, that causes the solution in the conical flask to turn from yellow to orange now the color change is very very obvious all right if you are unsure of what is the color change you can check out the video um, that's um, showing in the card right now here are some sources of error associated with acid-based titration now whenever we are using an alkali um, it has to be freshly pre prepared otherwise it may react with the carbon dioxide in the air remember that carbon dioxide is an acidic oxide so it can dissolve in water to produce a weak acid which will react with your sodium hydroxide so a possible source of error is that the solution may not be freshly prepared so it would have reacted with um, the carbon dioxide in air resulting in a lower concentration than expected okay so a possible modification is to prepare the solution just before the experiment or to perform standardization now what is standardization standardization means 
uh, another titration so before you use the alkaline uh, in the titration you have to check the concentration the actual concentration of your sodium hydroxide by performing a titration with another uh, standard reagent so with an acid and then you find out whether it is still the same concentration in the titration experiment um, you will be assessed for accuracy as well so your title value will be compared to your uh, teacher's title value and if it's too far away um, you may be penalized for accuracy now if you have been doing everything uh, accurately but somehow uh, your reading is different uh, consistently different from your teacher's reading um, here are some of the reasons if your title value is higher than what your teacher is having it could be that you did not rinse the sites of the conical flask near the end point okay and if your title value is consistently lower than what your teacher has or what your friends uh, have uh, could be because you did not um, discharge the last drop or you did not discharge enough solution from the pipette tip by gently scratching against the base of the conical flask now another type of titration that you can get is a redox titration so all the experimental considerations that you have for an acid based titration um, would be applicable here as well so the washing of the burette the filling up of the burette the washing of a pipette and how to use a pipette right the biggest difference between a redox titration and um, an acid based titration is that in a redox titration there's no need for an indicator right if you ever get a redox titration the titrant is very likely to be your potassium manganate 7 right we have learned in the syllabus that potassium manganate 7 is a powerful oxidizing agent all right but we have also learned that it is only a powerful oxidizing agent under acidified conditions so in a redox titration always look out um, for the step that requires you to add acid into the solution in the conical flask all right why is that important is because if you don't add acid um, the, you may not get the color change that's, ex that's expected um, when you're performing the titration the other thing is that when you're using potassium manganate 7 it's so intensely purple that you may not be able to see the bottom of the meniscus so in this case you just have to read from the top of the meniscus okay it will not make a difference to the results that you get again some sources of error would be that uh, if whenever you're using any redox reagents um, it can uh, re potentially react with oxygen in the air so these solutions must be freshly prepared as well another type of titration that you can get is called iodometric titration as the name suggests uh, it involves um, the titration of iodine with another reagent so most of the time um, you will be titrating iodine which is in the conical flask against sodium thiosulfate which is in the burette so sodium thiosulfate will react with the iodine now in the chapter of periodic table we have learned that iodine when dissolved in water is a brown solution so as more and more iodine is reacted away the solution will fade from brown to yellow all right at this point in time um, you need to add starch indicator okay and the starch indicator will actually turn the solution from yellow to dark blue all right or dark purple now why is that necessary is because as the amount of iodine gets lesser and lesser you the yellow color becomes um, very very faint so it becomes very hard to determine when is that one drop that causes the solution to become colorless but once you add starch indicator starch indicator actually uh, complexes or it, it 
uh, reacts with iodine to form a dark purple solution. So now the color change from dark purple to colorless is very very obvious. So the end point will be represented by the one drop of sodium thiosulfate that turns the solution from blue to colorless. All right, the color change is very obvious. You can check out the video um, as shown in the card. The next thing that we need to take note of would be the recording of data. Now, as I've always told you all, um, what the examiners will be marking for is not how you perform the experiment. You can perform a very good titration. Uh, you can perform a titration while juggling balls um, at the same time, but you will not get extra marks for that. But what the examiners will get to see is what you put down on paper. So even if you have done a perfect titration, but you fail to record your observations well, you will still flunk your practical exam. All right, so it's very important to take note of the points in this slide. For example, all your burette readings must be recorded to 2DP. Okay, the common mistake that students have um, is, to, uh, is that they forget to do so for uh, zero. Okay, so they will just put down as zero instead of 0, 0.00. The other very common mistake is that students put down the uh, initial burette reading as 50.00. Now bear in mind that this is the initial reading. So when you fill up a burette completely, the reading should be zero and not 50. Okay. The next thing would be your uh, best titration results. Now best titration results as the um, term suggests is made up of more than one reading. So there should never only be one tick in your titration table. Alright, so best titration results means um, two or more readings that are consistent with one another. So by consistent, we mean that it is 0 0.1 centimeter cube um, away from each other. Alright, and then once we have determined the best titration results, we need to show uh, the calculation for the average volume. Now in some years, um, the working for the average has a mark um, uh, tagged to it. So it's very important, even if you have the same reading, 24.1 plus 24.1 divided by 2, um, why is there a need to show the working? Um, you still have to show it, all right, so that we can give you that mark. In the calculations for titration, uh, it's very, very likely to um, to involve the 3C approach. Okay, so if you can recall, 3C means convert to moles, compare mole ratio, and then convert from moles. All right, and as you are converting to and from moles, very likely it's going to involve this particular equation that you see in this slide. Right, where number of moles equals to concentration times volume, or concentration equals to number of moles divided by volume. Now why is that so? It's because in titration we are always dealing with solutions. All right? And to find number of moles of a substance in a solution, we make use of these uh, equations over here. When you are doing calculations, it's very important to show proper statements for each step. Okay? Otherwise, we have no idea what you are doing. So um, commonly students like to do things like this, uh, 0 0.100 divided by um, 10 over 1000 equals to something most okay but we have no idea uh, and if you have a series of such equations such working without proper statements so we don't know what you are finding for and if you were to make a mistake somewhere there's no way for us to give you any marks because we cannot assume for you that in that step you are actually calculating for that um, variable Okay, few other uh, reminders. Don't uh, please leave your final answers to three SF. 
this is the convention uh, in O-levels and don't forget to include the units for every final answer. Now the next type of experiment that you will get uh, is calorimetry. Calorimetry, um, as the name suggests, calorie means um, heat. All right, the burning uh, means temperature changes. In calorimetric experiments, very likely you will be given a styrofoam cup, you will be given a beaker. Now reminder to place the styrofoam cup on the beaker so that it becomes more stable and, and it doesn't topple over uh, so easily. All right. uh, in calorimetric experiments, you will need to use a thermometer. Um, so please take note that thermom thermometer readings are recorded to 1 dp as I will show you again. And the decimal point can only be 0, so 0, 0 or 0.5. Another common mistake that students tend to make is to include units for every reading. Okay, please do not do that. Reason being, the units are already um, included in the header. So one common type of calorimetric experiment is called thermometric titration. Right? In this case, we add an acid to an alkali. All right, and then we measure the temperature rise. Um, so, as we have learned in energy changes, neutralization is an exothermic reaction. So, as we add more acid to an alkali, for example, um, you will get more and more reaction. You will get more and more heat released. But at a certain point in time, when all your alkali has been used up, then the reaction stops, there will be no more heat release and if you still continue to add acid from the burette, you will find that the temperature will then start to decrease because heat is lost to the surroundings. A few tips to take note when you are doing a thermometric titration is that your thermometer, the bulb of the thermometer must be immersed completely in the solution in order for an accurate reading. All right. Allow some time for the temperature to stabilize. Don't just place the thermometer, the bulb in the solution for one second and expect the temperature to be what you see. All right. In some thermometric experiments, you are supposed to wash, you are supposed to conduct the experiment multiple times. So if you need to wash the cup, uh, try to wash it thoroughly with tap water and then dry it as much as you can by shaking it vigorously. In, for a more accurate experiment, you should use a dry cup for every experiment. For thermometric titration, if, you, if we were to plot the temperature rise against uh, the volume of acid or alkali added, you, as mentioned, the temperature rise would increase and then decrease. So you are expected to draw two straight lines that will intersect each other. And one of the lines should pass through the origin. Now, where drawing a straight line um, is very common for your points to not exactly lie on the straight line. So you need to draw something called the line of best fit. All right? And in a thermometric titration, the most meaningful point will be the point of intersection. Why is that so? Because this represents um, the volume of your titrant that's required, all right, or the volume of the titrant at the equivalence point or at the end point of the titration. To draw a line of best fit, it must meet two criteria. One is that there must be equal number of points above and below the line. I need not be exactly but roughly equal number of um, points above and below the line and the distance of the spots, the perpendicular distance of the spots above the line must be roughly equal so it cancels out um, the distance of the spots that are below the line. So this is the meaning of a best fit line. Some sources of error when you are dealing with heat measurements is that heat could be lost to the surroundings. So as a result, when you record the temperature, it will be lower than actual. 
so some experimental modifications is if you didn't switch off the fans you can switch off the fans if you are not using a styrofoam cup if you are using a normal beaker um, you can use a styrofoam cup because with a styrofoam cup you will minimize heat exchange with the surroundings if you are already using a styrofoam cup you can place a second styrofoam cup um, for increased lagging what is lagging lagging is to um, uh, insulate or is to prevent heat exchange uh, between what is in the container and what is outside uh, and the surroundings outside the container another example would be to put a cover with an insert for the thermometer to prevent heat loss or to minimize heat loss to the surroundings the next type of experiment that you may encounter is qualitative analysis so in qualitative analysis you are required to add certain reagents and to make certain observations in order to predict what substances or what ions are present in the unknown solution um, in qualitative analysis questions you don't have to plan your own um, chemical tests so the instructions will always be given to you in qualitative analysis there are in general four things that you need to know how to test for they are cations and ions gases as well as oxidizing and reducing agents so I've included some images that um, help to trigger your memory of QA experiments now for example if I have a solution uh, an unknown solution and after adding sodium hydroxide drop wise I see this observation now how would you describe this very commonly students will say things like solution turns white or a white solution obtained okay so I just want to remind you all again there's no such thing as a white solution but it is a white PPT form okay now on adding excess sodium hydroxide I find um, the following observation so how would you write it white PPT form soluble in excess okay and commonly students will stop here soluble in excess and AOH now that is not enough you need to say um, when a PPT is soluble in a reagent that you add you need to tell us the color of the resulting solution right to give a colorless solution now in the bottom left picture you see a test for a gas and I hope you can see that um, the red limus paper has turned blue alright so there's only one gas in the syllabus that will give that that observation now whenever you are testing for a gas or writing the observation for a gas there are four points that you need to take note number one is um, you need to write effervescence okay or bubbles number two you need to describe the color and the odor of the gas in this particular experiment you would have um, obtained a colorless but pungent gas the third point that you need to write down is the test for the gas and the observations so gas turned moist red litmus paper blue okay bear in mind that you need to put the word moist because um, for an acid or an alkali to behave like an acid or alkali it must be first dissolved in water so if there's no water it will not have the characteristics of an acid or an alkali and then last one is to identify the gas gas is ammonia gas okay now is it necessary to write all four points um, or are all four points always given marks answer is no but it's safer to write down all four points each time a gas is being produced now in the last bottom right corner picture I think this is a very classic uh, observation that you will see how do you describe this is that you have a dirty green precipitate 
okay, which is insoluble in excess, regardless of whether it is ammonia or a sodium hydroxide that you are adding. Um, for when, if you are testing for this particular cation, chances are the question or the procedure will ask you to leave it standing in air. Now, what's the purpose of that? Is that your green PPT will turn um, brown after standing in air for some time. All right? Why? Because this is a classic um, observation when iron 2 hydroxide is oxidized by air, oxygen in air, to iron 3 hydroxide, which is reddish brown, a reddish brown solid. When you're doing a qualitative analysis experiment, it's very, very, very important to not go straight into the testing, but for each step to determine what the step is testing for. Okay, for example, if the question asks you to add sodium hydroxide dropwise followed by in excess, you need to write down first that you're testing for cations. Why is that important? Because it will guide you as to what observations to make. For example, uh, if we are testing for cations, you will be looking out for a PPT. And if there's a PPT, what is the color of the PPT? And then after adding in excess, whether the PPT dissolves in excess of your sodium hydroxide. Second example will be if you are asked to add sulfur, uh, the nitric acid followed by barium nitrate. This is a test for sulfate ions. So you will be on the lookout for whether a white PPT is formed. Okay, Identifying what ion um, each step is testing for also guides you in recording your observations so that you know what observation is expected. For example, uh, in the addition of barium nitrate, we are testing for sulfate. So your observation will be either white PPT form or no PPT form. That's all. Okay. When you are adding an acid or a solid to an acid or when you're adding something to a carbonate or something to a metal, all right, you should expect a gas to be formed. All right. And whenever a gas is formed, you're required to test for it. So um, do prepare in advance for the test. So for example, if the step requires you to add an acid to a gray or silvery solid, all right, it means that it's likely that the gray or silvery solid is a metal and hydrogen gas will be produced. So before you add the solid into the acid, you need to get ready a lighted spleen. Similarly, if you are asked to add acid to a, a white solid, where the white solid is likely to be a carbonate, so the reaction is going to be produce carbon dioxide gas. So before you, perf you add the solid, you need to prepare your lime water, you need to prepare your delivery tube, and as soon as you add the solid, you need to quickly cap the test tube with the delivery tube. Here are some examples of how you should record your observations for qualitative analysis and please take note of the common mistakes uh, that students tend to make um, when recording such observations. The next type of experiment that can be tested will be speed of reaction. Now one type of uh, speed of reaction experiments is known as a clock reaction. Right? What is a clock reaction? A clock reaction um, involves timing the duration it takes for a fixed amount of a precipitate or a substance, a colored substance to form. Okay, so in our experiments, we have done the sulfur clock experiment where we measured um, the time taken for a fixed amount of sulfur to form in a few um, experimental runs. So in each run, we vary the concentration of one of the reagents. For clock reactions which require the timing uh, of durations, 
it's important that you start the stopwatch at the same time for every run so what do i mean by that um, because you need to add one reagent to another reagent you need to pour it from one container to the other so when do you start timing is it when the first drop of the solution enters um, the other reagent or after all of the first reagent has entered the second reagent all right so you need to be consistent each time all right and and to avoid ambiguity what i would suggest is that you start timing when the last drop of the reagent added enters the solution in the container okay another tip would be that you if you can predict which experimental run is going to be the slowest start with the experiment because that will give you ample time to get ready um, uh, if you were to start with the fastest experiment it may be a matter of a few seconds before the, ex the um, experiment is over so you may be caught out especially if you are not used to the procedure another reminder um, with speed of reaction experiments is that you will be using a stopwatch and whenever you are recording data from a stopwatch or time using a stopwatch it must be recorded to the nearest second okay so whenever you are recording time using a stopwatch it must be recorded to the nearest second so for example 5 15 um, 45 and so on all right this is correct what is wrong would be 5.1 or 15.45 all right uh, the reason for that is um, that due to human reaction time your time that you measure can never be very accurate so we round it off to the nearest second to account for human reaction time sources of error with regards to clock reactions would be that it's difficult for the human eye um, to judge when does the cross fully disappear from view all right and also the human reaction time on starting and stopping the stopwatch so a modification that you can use is to use a calorimeter so calorimeter can actually measure the intensity of the color um, so we can fix an intensity every time to stop the stopwatch rather than to use the human eye as to judge another type of speed of reaction experiment is by measuring the volume of gas produced so we measure the time taken to produce a fixed volume of gas or we can measure the volume of gas produced in a fixed duration the experimental setup for such experiments usually include something that looks like a delivery tube but with a very long tube that's immersed into an inverted um, measuring cylinder so the this is this method of gas collection is like the displacement of water but with a measuring cylinder we can actually measure the volume of gas that is produced so what happens when the gas enters uh, when the gas is produced uh, is that you will displace the water in the measuring cylinder and from the final reading we can actually know how much gas is produced after a certain period of time such an experiment is very prone to errors it's very inaccurate um, reason being when uh, the split moment when you are um, when after you have added the reagent and when you cap the flask with the delivery tube some gas could have escaped okay and then uh, if you are measuring gases like oxygen or carbon dioxide they're actually a bit soluble in water so the volume of gas collected will be less than actual one modification that you can use um, to prevent the air from escaping um, due to the delay in capping the funnel or capping the conical flask is to use something called a dropping funnel now what is a dropping funnel so 
this is the conical flask all right a dropping funnel looks something like this all right so for example i can have some calcium carbonate in the conical flask i can fill up uh, the dropping funnel with sulfuric acid okay and then there's actually another opening that leads to your uh, water or leads to your uh, measuring cylinder that's immersed in the water so a dropping funnel actually has a tap and when you open the tap the solution can enter uh, and react with the calcium carbonate so in this case immediately um, after reaction the gas will be channeled into the measuring cylinder there's no chance for the gas to escape the last type of experiment um, is known as gravimetric analysis as the name suggests gravity means the measurements of masses okay so such experiments would involve the use of a weighing balance now earlier um, if you were to ask me whether such experiments will be tested i would say that it's highly unlikely because um, in an exam we wouldn't want students to queue up to use the weighing balance um, but surprise surprise it actually came out in 2019 o-level practical right where students really had to queue up to use the weighing balances or to use the electronic balances now one type of gravimetric experiment is to measure the mass loss as we heat a solid All right this is especially common when we have hydrated salts now if you can recall hydrated salts contain water of crystallization and what happens when you heat a hydrated salt is that the water of crystallization will be evaporated will be driven off okay so if we can measure the mass of the hydrated salt before heating and after heating to constant mass we can determine the mass loss which will be equal to the amount of water that was being driven off by the heating all right so a few things to take note um, when performing a, a, a gravimetric experiment is that you will need to heat you need to perform a few cycles of heating and weighing so you heat for five minutes you wait right, record the weight heat again for another five minutes and record the weight again now when do you stop is when you have two readings that are the same what does it mean it means that the mass is no longer changing so you have already driven off all the water of crystallization in the particular o level question um, the solid that uh, students were supposed to heat is actually sodium bicarbonate sodium bicarbonate can decompose on heating to give carbon dioxide and water okay so if you were to heat it very strongly for a long period of time um, you would have removed all the carbon that uh, you would have removed some carbon dioxide as well as water so the mass loss will be equals to uh, the mass of carbon dioxide as well as water the last part of a practical exam would be the planning question uh, in order to know how to approach a planning question please review the video on uh, planning